Hello everyone and welcome to Decentra, a visual novel by Safine Safine, I'm not really sure how you pronounce it, but I uh, found it on itch, it is a demo, so it's not the full thing, it is a visual novel, and I don't normally do visual novels, but this is going to be uh, one of the first times I've done one, so we'll see how it goes, but hopefully it's good, allow us to begin. Content warning, this game contains content with blood, death, violence, and unhealthy relationships between characters, and horrific imagery that players may find uncomfortable or disturbing. Player discretion is advised. Please play responsibly and take care of yourself. I drag myself through the rain. It blurs my vision, forcing me to feel my way through the forest. Wind crushing against me from all sides. Prayer is my only form of navigation, but I think the blood running through my veins prevents me from landing in God's graces. I fumble over the tangle of roots and slip over wet moss. My bones instantly shudder from the cold shock running through my nails as I grab onto a nearby rock. A pathetic whine escapes my throat. My grandmother would have, would have a ball if she could see me now. I can hear her snide remark already. See what happens when you don't listen to me? As if I wouldn't survive long enough to hear the real deal. I sniffle in frustration and try to shake the feeling away with the rain dripping down my face. She's always right, of course. I just... For just a moment, my defiance had given me everything I wanted. Lost in thought, I lose control of my limbs. I'm not used to using them all at once, and it's enough to throw me back into this slick earth. Now I really want to cry. The storm is harsh. A thick canopy of trees above me does little to shield me from its rage. They passively turn their leaves away instead, tempting me to scream my grandmother's harshest curses at them. Am I losing it? I shakily lift myself from the ground, snorting weakly into a puddle. For the middle of summer, it sure is pouring hard. The rain feels like shards of ice against my skin. I watch it distort the reflection in the puddle with ripples. In the brief moments where the reflection almost settles, I see piercing yellow eyes, dark fur, and wilted ears, sleek and clinging to the small, vulnerable form of a wolf pup. The voice of my grandmother hisses in my mind. What have you done, Basil? I need to get back home. I tear away from the puddle and trek on. Please, something lead me back home. Something. Anything. Maybe that's a risky thing to ask of this forest, though. Because something answers. It's so faint that I question if it's even real. A howl cuts through the wind, or perhaps it's the wind that shrinks away from the sound that ambles through. Fighting my way through the storm has exhausted my body. The frontal lobe of my brain begins to neglect its responsibility to remember what reason is. All my instincts scream to ignore it, but my heart, a stupidly curious thing, makes me take a step forward. My fuzzy ears pick up the heavy sounds of my heart pounding. I try to convince myself it's because of fear. I need to focus on where the howling's coming from. As I get closer to the sound, it begins to resemble crying. The storm has also started to retract its claws. Was it the forest showing mercy, or has it submitted to something more formidable? I've lived in the woods my whole life. I should know better than anyone to never get too comfortable. A red light perforates the dark atmosphere. I swallow harshly. There's a mansion in the middle of the woods. From a distance, it would look abandoned, if not for the hazy red light coming from the rooftop. I squint. Is that... a greenhouse? A shadowy figure moves quickly behind its clear walls, startling me. I duck into the tall and neglected grass that grows in the mansion's yard. After a short while, I peek through the blades. The shadow is gone. Did I imagine it? 
I release a nervous sigh and observe the grounds for any signs of life. Or death. It was a bad idea to come here. A terrible one, even. I can't stay here. I retreat back into the shadows of the forest, keeping the mansion in my light of sight. The moment I feel bold enough to turn my back against it, a powerful gale slams into me. I tumble back hard, skidding across the ground and into the tall grass with a cry. It takes me a moment to recover from my swirling vision. I let out a whimper as pain blooms from my arm. It's too dark to see clearly, but it swells up when I try to move. Oh no. Oh no, no, no. I grip my teeth and get back on my feet, keeping my weight off my arm as I make for the forest again. Again, I am denied entrance by the mysterious force. Panic starts to seep through my bones. I almost wish I could go back to feeling hopeless. I stare at the trees as though they, they'll suddenly start playing nice, but beings as ancient, ancient as them do not bend to anyone's will but their own. The wind gives one more shove. It insists I move forward. I bear my adolescent fangs at it to smother the hurt. I know that my choices were nothing but illusions. I face the mansion once again. It's clear that something, or someone, from the inside is inviting me in. With no other choice, I creep along the worn brick walls of the mansion and try to find a way in. I go to a window. I spy a broken window and see a gauzy white curtain thrashing against the glass from the intruding storm. Sadly, it's far too high for me to climb, and there's no way I can jump in this state. I go to a cellar door. I find a door to a cellar. The wind looks rotten, but it doesn't give when I put my weight on it. It's also too heavy for me to pry open without thumbs. I go somewhere else. A faint knocking grabs my attention. I pad to the back of the mansion and my saving grace comes in the form of a door left slightly ajar. Aha! I nudge my nose into the tight gap and relief washes over me when it parts. Then, an ear-piercing screech echoes through the mansion as the hinges began, begin to shift. From the looks of it, they haven't moved for a long time. The feeling of ice floods my veins. I stay frozen in the doorway. If this mansion is inhabited, there's no way I didn't just announce my entrance. Fear takes over again. My back paw intuitively steps back so I can attempt to run as far away from this place as I can. The sound of thunder explodes behind me. I feel my body take on a life of its own as I throw myself into the mansion against my will. The door slams on my way in. I breathe shallowly. When I come to my senses, I'm in a kitchen. It's dark inside the house. The only source of light comes from the windows above the counters. Everything beyond its reach is a void. I see a kitchen table and crawl towards it, scratching my nails along the musty wood flooring in a rush to get beneath it. I stay under the table as my breathing starts returning to a normal pace. My eyes are wide and my ears are perked up on the lookout for anything that could be a threat. The only sounds I pick up are the heavy drums of rain from outside and the occasional creak of the mansion walls breathing in the night air. When I'm confident that there's no sign of life inside this manor, I crawl back into the open and immediately shake off as much rain and mud as I can. I let myself celebrate the minor luxury of finally escaping the maws of the weather, but I don't let my nerves calm down just yet. As soon as my eyes adjust better to the dark, I take the time to study my surroundings more. I notice a hearth that lacks any recent maintenance. Dishes crowd the counter, and a thick layer of dust forces me to smother a sneeze. This place hasn't been occupied in a long time. Surely I can allow myself to breathe just a little bit easier in this space, at least until the storm wanes. I bring in a deep inhale being careful not to get any dust, and tread cautiously. As I stalk further in, I hold my breath at every corner, carefully looking in all directions for danger. 
The rest of the mansion is as devoid of life as the kitchen. Most of the rooms here have closed doors. The ones I could see in were graciously empty. Sans the derelict furnishings within. Barely anything is in decent shape. I couldn't guess how long it's been since a human lived in this manor. But based on the scratched hardwood floors and the broken but intricate looking side table nested in a dark corner, I have the impression that this place was neglected even while it was occupied. My nails tap on the floor as I limp into the hallway, my mind settling from all the adrenaline. The ache in my front leg starts to swell and the heat of my body intensifies the pain. Paintings line the walls from end to end, but it's hard to see them in the dark. Through glimpses of light, I could make out some faded landscapes, a few mountains, some castles, and a couple of portraits. One portrait in particular catches my eye. I stop in front of it. I stare at the portrait, foolishly thinking that it's staring right back. Surely it's just the slight fever settling in and making me come up with silly things. I don't think I've lost my mind just yet, though. As I observe the side profile of a pale woman, I notice that she's eerily the most realistic painting I've seen so far. When she turns her head to look down at my tiny form, every hair on my body goes stiff. Her lovely features captured in oil begin, begin to melt off as she steps out from the painting. Smooth ivory skin shrivels to a deathly pallor. The elaborate gown, the elaborate gown clinging to her sharp shoulders begins to rot as her torso parts open like a blooming rose, revealing decaying bone and organs that run down her skirt like horrific decor. I immediately start running away as fast as I physically can. As I scramble to get away on my hurt leg, I hear something that might be worse than a ghost. The woody and spicy scent of incense fills the humid air, creating a hazy purple fog. The sound of chains moving in a controlled rhythm rattles me to the marrow in my bones. Footsteps follow shortly after, growing louder alongside the clinking chains. It's coming from the staircase. My breath quickens. I slide to a halt and backtrack away from the sounds. I look behind me and see the glowing apparition of the woman's hunched form stumbling towards me dragging a trail of gore with a wet squelch. Hide. I need to hide. But where? My eyes dart across every inch of the hallway, desperately searching for a small sanctuary. The footsteps are right behind me. The ghost is right in front of me. This hallway now feels like a tome. tomb. All of the doors are firmly shut. I press against a wall, my heart skipping a beat when I notice a faint tapping sound coming from behind me. I turn around and witness the outline of a door revealing itself. I waste no time shoving my muzzle between the crack to wrench it open. As soon as I pry the door open, I hurl myself through, back into the darkness. I walk backwards away from the door, keeping my eyes on it. I'm so focused on the door that I bump into something cold and almost trip over it. I look up and see a dark iron staircase curling up to a high ceiling. A hatch near the top is open, letting the rain from outside drip down onto the cold metal. I hear footsteps once again, this time much louder. I don't dare to breathe or move. There you are. The voice startles me into moving. No way I was about to stick around and find out what fate awaits me. Every fiber of my being is ringing with danger as I climb the stairs, with only adrenaline instructing my limbs. I drag myself up the iron steps until I'm bursting onto the roof and back into the storm. I'm not thinking anymore. I see the greenhouse I had spotted earlier and sprint towards it as fast as I can. I search for a small space to crawl into, tripping over a mess of vines along the way. Thunder and lightning roar above me. A bright flash of white bl blinds me. I can feel my claws scratch against the wet tiles. A door slams shut in the distance, causing a rippling effect in the walls and reaching the rooftop. 
When the rippling stops, everything goes quiet. The energy of the manor shifts completely. A jolt of lightning from the storm makes my fur stand. It charges the air and saturates it with the smell of ozone. I shake the rain from my face. The whole world has fallen silent, except for the sound of a chilling drip. Basil. I freeze. My eyes carefully follow the coil of dead roots on the gray floor of the greenhouse. Drip. I follow its trail all the way to the blood dripping onto the dirty tiles and the pale feet beside it. My eyes climb the mysterious figure. I don't think I'll ever forget the sight before me for as short as I live. Lightning flashes brightly through the tall windows. Looming rose bushes creep along them. White roses speckled across its dark, le dark leaves like stars in the night sky. The bright flowers begin to bleed red before my very eyes. At the rose bush's crimson-soaked center, a small girl stands with her back towards me. Blood drips from tiny bite marks all over her hand. A red flower bulb is crushed between her delicate fingers. Instead of a strong floral scent, the smell of burning paper and wilting lilacs flood my senses. A whine unwillingly crawls up my throat and cuts through the silence. Time resumes once again. The girl turns, her gaze piercing, piercing right through me. The bowl drops from her hand. She doesn't say a word, her attention is mine, against my own will. Black dots begin to appear in the corners of my vision. The last thing I saw was her walking towards me, before everything faded to dark. My fever is brutal throughout the night. I slip in and out of consciousness to flames beneath my skin and an ache I'd rather sleep off than face. I try to let my body go back to sleep, but strong hands force my jaws open and shove something down my throat. The intrusion makes me violently resist, but I'm far too weak to fend the intruder away. The dark takes me into its arms once again. I wake to the tang of rusty metal and humid air. The unfamiliar sensation makes my eyes snap open. Beyond the small cage that holds me, it's dark and damp. I clench my jaw as I examine my surroundings. Soon my eyes fixate on the ghost staring at me from outside my metal prison. I yelp and throw my body backwards, hitting the back of the cage. I expect a bite of hard metal on my back, but something smooth bends around my shape instead. It hisses at me in response, but I don't think it liked that very much. My claws scrape the cold floor of the cage as I spin. The bars behind me morph into slithering vipers in defensive stances, each one bearing, bearing their bangs in anger. Careful. Their venom will make the blood in you and your body solidify in seconds. That would be a very pleasant way to die. I look at the ghost in horror. I'm breathing so quickly that I'm convinced I'll die from lack of oxygen, or so I think. The vipers settle back into metal bars and I make myself small. I don't want to risk testing their patience again. The ghost is not a ghost, but a girl. Her hair looks like ink that's been violently knocked over and spilled onto the floor. It melts into the dark surroundings, contrasting her gray and sickly looking skin. Her expression is blank. I see her hands tightly clutching her white gown. Do you bite? Do you, I want to ask. I reveal my teeth through a snarl and watch as she shows hers with a small smile. The fur along my spine stands up. She starts to move, and I flinch. The girl crawls toward the cage, and I curl my nails. She reaches for me, a pale hand passing between the bars without resistance. It freezes right in front of my snout. Is she checking to see if I would really bite? Has she no fear, offering her hand so fiercely in the presence of a beast? I may only be a pup, but the sheer force of my jaws can pierce right through her palm. I repel from her hand. I pull my face away from her hand and see her startle from my peripheral vision. 
She pulls her hand back and holds it against her collar. My eyes lock with hers as she stares at me with her lips pressed together. It'll be hard for me to protect you if you're so if you're too scaredy cat to do as I say. My eyes snap back to the girl. I watch as she stands up and wipes her hands on her dress, not showing a single care about how dirty it's become. If you want to survive, you'll have to listen to my instructions. Okay, doggy? She tilts her head like she expects me to respond. Don't try to be too brave. If you're smart, you'll stay careful. If the others had too much fight in them. It made them foolish. My heart pounds in my chest from her words alone. She gives me another haunting smile. When your arm is better, I'll take you for a walk before he gets back. Is this what she sounds like when she's exciting? excited? It's unsettling. She suddenly moves close to the cage again. I jump and back away, just enough where I don't risk getting into trouble with the vipers again. The scent of burning parchment and wilting lilacs returns. The girl's hair falls off her shoulders. I expect ink to trickle down and dye her dress black. My name is Dove. Horrible to meet you, Dove. Roses. I spend the night nursing the dregs of my fever. When I'd first woken up, I didn't take notice of how much of it I'd already been soothed. But now vague memories of violating hands surface in my thoughts. Did the girl, Dove, give me some kind of medicine during the height of my fever? My body still feels uncomfortably warm. I rest my head on one arm and glance at the one that had been hurt earlier. A clean bandage is firmly wrapped around it. Not enough to cut off the blood flow, but enough to restrict its movement. Was this also Dove's handiwork? I sigh softly through my nose and close my eyes. Time passes ambiguously in the cage. With nothing to reference, I don't know if it's been mere hours or days. A bowl of water sits in the corner of my cage. I know from the dryness of my throat that I need to hydrate, but I have yet to muster up the courage to approach the bars that slither and rattle every so often. When I'm desperate enough to finally quench my thirst, the bars relievingly keep their metal forms. Feeling better now, I curl into a ball and my tail cradles my face. I want to go home. Exhaustion catches up to me once again. I fall asleep on crusty metal and wake on dusty wood. The sound of my wind chimes alert me into consciousness. My eyes snap open, and my retinas are immediately burned by the color that floods into them. On the floor in front of me is a kaleidoscope of lights created by the morning sun, a stark contrast to the dark and dreary setting I was previously confined to. Maybe I dreamed it all in a feverish haze. I check on the gauze around my arm, it's still there. A weight around my neck brings me back into focus. A collar is secured around my throat. Attached to it is a long and heavy chain that leads to the leg of a large wardrobe in the corner of the room. The bedroom. I take in my latest cage. There are no longer venomous bars to keep me, but the state of confinement has not changed. My eyes move from the rainbows on the floor to the line of the chain restraining me, then to the rest of the room. I look at the windows and find swirling murals and expressive paintings of various creatures and monsters. The sun behind them illuminates the floor with speckles of color like a stained glass window. Past the frame of the window, the drawings continue in nonsens non nonsensical scrawl. Less art decorates the walls, but shelves with cracked plant pots and hanging tangles of ivy take their place. Dirty cups and bowls sit forgotten in a dark corner. I briefly note two shallow dishes near where I lay. They look like they would be used by a pet. Judging from the surprising lack of grime from under them, it hasn't been that long since they were last used. Dusty books and crumpled parchment litter the floorboards. Taking up half of the room is a canopied bed. Dark curtains are pulled tightly together, preventing me from seeing inside. The sound of scratching captures my attention. I drag my gaze past piles of books. There, sitting on a raggedy blanket, hunched over and scribbling over the print in a book, is Dove. 
She gnaws on her lip and pinches her brows. I can hear her whispering something to herself. No, no, no. That won't work. I slowly lift myself off the floor, cringing at the sound of clanking chains following my movement. Dove makes no move acknowledging my presence, so I continue approaching her. When I'm closer to her back, I'm able to get a better look at what she's furiously writing. Scribbles of occult symbols make the words on the pages completely illegible. I swallow a lump in my throat. The collar around my neck feels very heavy right now. Dove suddenly tears a page out from the book. The jarring sound makes me jump, and I slam into a tower of books, sending it toppling to the floor. Dread weighs heavily on me. I look back at Dove. She's now staring at me with wide eyes. You're awake! I release a small yelp and stare at her dumbfounded. She's brighter. Or maybe it's the luminous light filtering through the bedroom window. Something about it paints her in a rose-tinted lens that makes my wariness waver. That feeling instantly vanishes when she gets up and rushes towards me. I run away as fast as my legs allow me, but my air supply is abruptly cut off and I'm thrown off my feet. A sharp howl is pulled from my throat. I look behind me and see that the chain of my collar is pulled taut. I had reached its limit. I then see Dove standing in the spot I had bolted from. Her gaze creeps along the chain, making its way to my crumpled form. Icy blue eyes stare into mine and I shudder. It feels like she could unravel me through sight alone. She looks at me like she knows. Then she perks up, snapping the tension away. Alright, you're probably starving. The others were also very skittish when they had empty bellies. Her voice trails off as though she's become lost in thought. She starts weaving through the mess of book piles to reach the bedroom door. Wait here. I don't have much of a choice. Dove returns with the bread roll in a bowl. She sets the bowl down a couple of feet in front of me and retreats back to chew on her own food. I tentatively approach it. The bread smells like heaven. I lick my lips on instinct. It must have been ages since I last ate because I watch her tear chunks from it and mark every little crumb falling onto her white dress with yearning. I look down at the bowl she left for me. The, sl the sight of red fleshy chunks greets me. Raw meat. She gave me a bowl of raw meat. I can't eat this. Uh, well, maybe I could. But the idea of it has nausea coursing through me. I stare at the fresh blood pooling at the bottom of the bowl. Then I glance over at the bread, then back down to the bowl feeling confounded. My stomach growls. I can feel saliva start to drip down the side of my mouth. I can't. I can't do it. Are you going to let it go to waste? Dove's voice comes from right above me, and fear flutters in my stomach. Hmm. Okay, then. My eyes snap up. Dove reaches for me and I flinch, scattering away. She kneels in front of the bowl and dips her hand, hand into it, crushing a fistful of squishy red meat between her fingers. She brings the raw meat to her mouth. I watch her eat it. Bile rises in my throat as I watch her chew through the raw flesh and swallow with a sickly gulp. She covers her mouth with the back of her hand and gags, then looks at me. She smiles at me, her teeth stained in a glistening red. What a horrible taste. A thin, thin stream of blood falls from the corner of her mouth. I suppose you'd like something a little more... appetizing? She gags again, then runs out of the room. I hear the sound of her retching from another room. Dove returns with a new bowl of what looks like stew. I inspect it thoroughly, checking for insects or anything inedible. When I surmise that there's nothing of the sort, I dig in greedily. 
My eyes begin to sting after the first couple bites. The stew is so bland. It makes me yearn for my grandmother's cooking so badly. From the corner of my eye, I can see Dove watching me like a hawk. Like all it'll take is a single blink for me to disappear. If only I could. As I finish eating the stew, a soft thudding captures my attention. I look back to see my tail wagging against the floor. I feel myself shrink with embarrassment. I immediately cease its movement, but not before Dove takes notice. Looks like your energy has returned. Her eyes move to my arm. Does it still hurt? I stare at Dove, then hesitantly put my weight on my wrapped up arm. The sharp pain is mostly gone, but a dull ache still remains. If the opportunity for me to run away came, I could probably do it, but not without difficulty. I make a frustrated whine. Dove tilts her head at me, considering my reply. She approaches me again, slowly this time. I hold my breath as she comes close, her hands hovering near the collar around my neck. I'm suddenly hyper aware of how quiet it is. There's no drum of rain or crack of thunder to be heard from outside. Hope dares to grow inside my racing heart. Will you hurt me if I take it off? I answer her. I shake my head slightly. Dove gives me a curious look. Her hands hover for a short moment, then she nods. The weight of the collar lifts off my shoulders. Then I bolt. My swift escape shoves Dove aside. I barely see her get thrown to the floor as I make for the open bedroom door. Dove makes a panic noise behind me. It fades out in my rush to leave her behind, then I'm back into the hallway where the horrors began. I need to get back. I need to go back to the kitchen. I sprint to the stairs. Then suddenly I'm skipping, skidding to a stop when a wall meets me at the end of the hall instead of the staircase. I stare in confusion. Did, did I go the wrong way? I look around the hall. I don't remember seeing this many doors. The sinking feeling unravels in my gut. I run down a new hallway. Then turn into another. Than another. My exploration of the manor was cut short when I'd first arrived, so maybe I can't remember everything well enough. But I swear, these are not the same halls I walked through before. After I turn into the 15th hallway in this new labyrinth, the sound of something being dragged cuts off my thoughts. I look behind me, fear pulsing in my veins. A ghostly figure slowly walks down the cross section of another hall. Long hair protrudes from its head running down to the floor stiffly like straw and hiding most of its long, thin limbs. I watch it disappear around the corner, completely frozen in my spot. Another ghost. I've never seen one this corrupted before. I now feel extremely vulnerable, like a beacon standing in the long and open corridor. Tapping noise is next. My heart pounds violently in my chest as I search for the sound. I immediately see another ghost heading straight for me. I yelp and crush myself against the wall, as if it'll make me invisible. This ghost staggers towards me with the bony knees knocking, with bony knees knocking together. A thin veil curtains its upper body, and something that resembles a bird's beak peeks out at its chest. The closer it gets, the better I'm able to make out the detail of its leathery skin and the beady bloodshot eyes that dappled across its face above the rotting beak. Needle-thin arms bend sharply at the elbow and reach back behind the ghost's head. It balances on its elbows and pulls itself forward on them. I make myself paper-thin and shiver when part of its elbow brushes against one of my paws. I start breathing again when it passes quietly, then back away into an intersection of hallways. Another ghost almost tramples me. Two ghosts follow one another down the path of the bird-like ghost. One is a cluster of what looks like fungi, fungi and twisting fabric that melts into bumpy flesh. A stringy network of mycelium trails behind it. Mycelium. The other creates a sound of glass crunching together with every steady step it takes. Its arms stick out like pieces of wood that lightly swing as it walks, and where its face should be is a void framed by jagged, broken pieces of porcelain skin. I 
can still make out the raggedy maid uniform that clings, clings to its bloated form. I follow the ghost in a trance. Like a line of school children, they walk along a well-known path. Normally, when a ghost is corrupted from being trapped in the land of the living, every semblance of their humanity is lost. So where do these ghosts stalk to so much, of pur so much purpose? They navigate the hallways without hesitation, twisting and turning through a route already well-worn. Then so painfully easy, I have been led back to the kitchen. I see Dove standing on the kitchen table, delicately twisting an incandescent bulb into the hanging light fixture. Dried black tears stain her cheeks, but her expression betrays no sign of dejection. Another bulb is held loosely in her other hand. This one has been burnt out so badly that no light can penetrate its ashy, blackened surface. It took 40 years to develop this type of filament. The ghosts around her. I watch them reach for her and I open my jaws to bark out a warning, but I choke on my rising panic. Dove doesn't notice them and continues to screw in the bulb. I read that these bulbs can stay lit for up to 1,200 hours. Claws brush against her skirt. And yet, after less than a week, their legacy of lighting, the dark has been snubbed out forever. With one last turn of her wrist, light envelops the room. Something so wonderful. Duff stares into the bulb's light and her fingers caress the glass. Only breaks in a place like this. The ghosts have vanished. Dove gives no hint of awareness for the presence that had just left them. My blood thuds in my ears. Could she not see them? I look at the door that I'd used to enter the mansion. I hear Dove dust off her hands and toss the old bulb into a box where it shatters amongst other pieces of glass. She sighs wearily. How long will this cycle continue for? I barely hear her words. Instead, I stare at the wall where the back door should be. And there is no door. I immediately freak out. I run to the wall, ignoring the ache of my arm, and scratch at old wallpaper, hoping the door was only hidden behind it. My claws tear through wood, but as I continue scratching, the outline of a door does not reveal itself. I back away, staring at the shredded decoration and breathing rapidly. It's not there anymore. I turn my head up and see Dove sitting on the kitchen table, swinging her legs. She stares at the wall, it torn up, and gives me a blank expression. I explode. My body ignites with fiery rage as I growl and snarl at her. Bark, 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 bark. She frowns, and her eyes turn downcast with guilt. I don't know how to get it back. I bark louder. Bark, 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 bark. Def, Def, Def covers her ears and glares at me. Doing that will solve nothing. I need catharsis. I whimper and go back to scratch the door, more in desperation. I'm sorry. Enough. I'm tired of seeing you wallow in your despair. I reply with an indignant huff. I see Dove puff her cheeks in annoyance. I turn my head away and rest it on my paws. There's no way out. It's better for you to just accept it. A growl rumbles in my throat. Even the front door is gone, so instead of wasting time, you may as well follow me and keep yourself occupied. I wish I could cry. My ears lay flat against my skull. I've landed myself right in the mouth of a carnivorous flower with the sweetness of shelter to lure me in, and I've never considered whether it would let me go once I'd treaded past its sharp teeth. I take a peek at Dove. She doesn't seem to have any problem with being a caged bird. She's so comfortable living in these conditions that she can't even see how wrong it is. How can anyone possibly live like this? Her patience reaches its end and she slides off the kitchen table. I cry out when she hauls me off the ground and I bare my fangs at her when her face appears right before mine. My glare doesn't faze her. Follow, wolf. There is much to do. We return to the labyrinth of hallways. Dove seems to know her way around them well. Now that I'm not frantically running through them, I notice how much different the atmosphere of the manor is. 
Less dirt coats the floor, ceiling lights illuminate the hallways, and it almost feels peaceful. Dove stops by a closet in the hallway. She grabs onto the handles of the doors, and it opens up to reveal shelves and cupboards of miscellaneous tools and supplies. She climbs a stool to reach the highest shelf and retrieves a box with small buckets and brushes. The stool she stands on starts to sway, and I tense. She climbs back down without issue, then leads me into a room I recognize. She makes her way to the broken side table I'd spotted when I was first exploring the rooms of the mansion, and I take the time to look around. A dining table with only three chairs takes up most of the room. Candles spike up from the top like stalagmites. There's so many that I think they would render a fire hazard if they were to all be lit. Hardened wax strips over the edge. I can see the end of a fountain pen as well as scraps of paper. I'm unable to see a well of ink from my position, but I assume that is what runs down the dusty tablecloth in dark splotches. A glint catches my attention. On the other side of the room, I'm unsettled by the mirrors that cover the wall from floor to ceiling. I swallow a lump that forms in my throat and do not let my eyes linger on them. I lay on the floor and watch her slather strongly scented glue on the broken leg of the table. She roughly connects the broken leg to the rest of the table and fans it with her hand so it dries faster. She tests its sturdiness with a light finger, then scrunches her nose when it wobbles. She twists around and digs in her box, then pulls out a roll of twine with a bright expression on her face. My brows furrow together. Dove twirls the string around the leg and binds it tightly. When she's done, she sets the table straight again. It still rocks unsteadily, but it stays standing. That seems to be good enough for Dove, because she picks up her box again and gives it a nod. I leap from my spot on the floor and spin to a loud noise. In the corner of the room, the long-haired ghost from earlier stands bent over a broken vase. I flinch when Dove lets out a startled noise and starts to stride towards it. I bark an alarm. It's dangerous. She ignores me. Ziri? I grab the back of her gown with my teeth to stop her. Dove's demeanor goes from angry to taken aback. She stops and looks down at me. I shock myself with my own actions and quickly drop her skirt. Dove considers me for a moment, then switches her attention back to the ghost and marches over to him. You klutz. My jaw drops. I don't need another person to clean up after. The ghost laces its long fingers together and bows its head. When Dove gets closer to it, it she stumbles and cries out. The ghost snaps its head back up to her. Dove checks the bottom of her foot and sees a shard embedded in the flesh. Red blooms from the small wound. The ghost makes a groaning sound and steps towards Dove. She hisses when it walks through the mess of glass and drags it with him. It's concern for her. I observe their interactions befuddled. Everything I know about corrupted ghosts is being challenged. I pause to think about how the ghost rushed to her side earlier. The ghost tugs on Dove's sleeve like it's asking for forgiveness. She continues to badger it while digging the shard out of her foot. I study them curiously. It wasn't because they wanted to cause her harm. I trail behind Dove when she leaves to treat the small cut and when she returns to clean up the mess. We leave the ghost and Dove continues down whatever to-do list she has in her mind. While she paints over the scratches on the kitchen door, trying to match the old wallpaper, she speaks to me. Have you met all of them already? She doesn't speak again until we run into another ghost. It awaits in the hallway for Dove. She perks up when she sees what it's holding. Oh, thank you, Babel. 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 She takes a small bundle of red roses from it, freshly torn from its bush. I follow her, follow her to a window and see a tall, thin glass vase with withered roses in it sitting on a still. Sill. Dove takes out the dead flowers and replaces them, then she pauses and looks down at something below. Her face reveals nothing as she tears her gaze away and makes her way down the hall again. Before following her, I stand on my haunches and try to peer out the window. 
A chill comes down on me when I look down and see a small patch of graves, each marked by a small, by small wooden crosses. I break away from the unnerving sight and turn towards the hall where Dove had gone down. She stands at the end of the hallway waiting for me. The bird-like ghost's name is Grell, and the doll-like ghost, doll ghost's name is Odette. Dove introduces him officially when we run into them as we go around the manor doing mundane tasks. It's a sight I can't get used to. I can't understand how a young girl can act so normal around such monstrous beings. Seeing their translucent, leathery skin or the fluids that drip from their decaying flesh is enough to send me reeling. But she does not flinch or fear. Earlier, when they had surrounded her in the kitchen, she could tell they were there, weaving their arms together to wrap her in a ghostly embrace, and she didn't care in the slightest. I start to think she's more disturbing than the ghosts. To become this corrupted, they would have had to stay trapped in this plane for a long time. Why are they still here? The horrific forms border on pitiful. To be this far gone, it has to be some type of hell. Dove walks amongst them like they're her family, though. No, that's not quite it. I reconsider my thoughts. Maybe. The image of the graves flashes in my mind. It's because she is theirs. I watch her guide Grell's gangly limbs out of the hallway so they can pass through, like they're nothing but an annoying sibling. A monster, just like them. Maybe this cage she lives in is of her own making. Dove does these errands like a routine, putting books away in the library and cleaning up candles burned to the end of their wicks. By the time she finishes winding up a large grandfather clock in the hallway, the manor feels like a completely different place. The air is less stifled by dust particles, the rooms are brighter and it feels like a home now. As we walk back to Dove's room, the sun begins its descent into the blazing orange horizon, and the evening cicadas make their shrill voices heard. Despite the manor feeling more livable, there is a feeling it gives me that I cannot shake. A void that looms like a presence. It's like letters left unfinished, or tea half empty and turning cold. There's this sense of stagnation that places this manor outside of time's reach, and it leaves a noise that buzzes persistently in the air. Dove stops abruptly, and I almost trip over my paws, trying not to run into her. I take a peek from behind her and immediately let out a yelp. The very first ghost I had met stands at the end of the hallway. Dove doesn't move. I see the ghost stagger down the hall toward us and I instinctively back away. Then Dove speaks. It's okay. I'm not reassured in the slightest. The ghost gets closer and I can see the details of her leaking on entrails. I make a whimpering sound and hide behind Dove, keeping myself close to the wall. She's harmless. She doesn't do anything. I throw a quick glance at Dove when her voice falters. But watch. The ghost is right behind it, beside us. Its milky eyes look down at Dove and she holds its unseen gaze with cold eyes. I don't breathe. But the sour smell of rot overwhelms my heightened sense of smell. The tension between Dove and the ghost creates a pressure that thins the air, makes my making my lungs ache for oxygen. Pain seizes my chest, just when I can no longer hold my breath in. The ghost continues down the hall, passively. I excel. Loudly. I startle when Dove clenches her fist beside me. Her eyes follow the ghost for a couple seconds longer, then she cuts off her stare and moves on. I quickly chase after her, not wanting to be alone with this particular ghost again. Ever again, if my luck allows it. I look back for a split second and the ghost has disappeared. Dove's shoulders are squared as we return to her room. Since the sun is set in the opposite direction of her window, the scattering of colors from this morning is long gone. Her relationship with the hallway ghost is much different from the others. The way she spoke about her almost seemed resentful. 
I pad to a corner, stalling for a moment when I see the collar from earlier on the floor. I narrow my eyes at it and pick it up with my teeth. Then I throw it at the far wall. I give, I give the collar one last glare, then curl up on the floor. Dove settles cross-legged in the middle of her book, towers, and reaches for a net random text. I let out a big yawn, feeling heavy after the events of the day. I don't know if there's enough time in the world to process everything that's happened to me since I left home. I close my eyes and feel the tendrils of sleep curl around me. Do you think people can come back from the dead? She asks it so quietly, I almost don't hear her. I don't think she expects an answer, and I cannot give her one. I wince at the bites. The roses are extra hungry today. It's been so long since I fed them that their petals have bleached white. I watch as my blood saturates the colorless flowers, then narrows my eyes when I spot a parasitic fungi, fungi at the base of the bush. Part of the bush is already starting to wither because of it. I reach down and tear the terrible thing out. I know more will sprout in its place, but I refuse to leave such a blight near my creation. I walk to a different section of the greenhouse and throw it right next to the corpse of the fungi's latest victim. My heart clenches at the sights. Its eyes are still open. I press my fingers down on the lids of the dead wolf, but it's too late. The terror on its face is already cemented in time. My fingers curl and my nails stab into my palm, making the bite sting. I return to the rose bush and continue to feed them. Thunder and lightning thrash above me. Will it learn another pitiful soul tonight? I hear a door slam and I flinch, crushing a bulb in my hand. My ears listen intently, searching for lingering traces of his presence. When I find none, I take a deep breath and finally let myself relax. I tear the bulb from its stem and my hands fall to my sides. The sound of the rain is so clear now as I close my eyes to let it wash out everything else. I relish in its violence against the roof of the greenhouse and tremble under the crisp cracks of thunder. To pass the time, now that it is mine again, I whisper something my mother taught me under my breath. Then, I hear a whimper come from behind me. Thank you for playing the demo. Well, that was a pretty good experience. Uh, that's that's for me. That's also like my first time trying to really do a visual novel and read it. And um, I have no idea how it's going to pan out and if it's going to be something that anybody actually made it through. But if you made it through the whole thing, thanks a lot means a lot to me. I guess it does. No, for real, it does. Uh, but if it's something that you want me to do again. Leave a note in the comments and say like, hey, you know, that was cool. You did a good job doing visual novels or whatever. And, and I'll, you know, I'll do them more. But Desindra, pretty interesting story. Really great artwork. Uh, really, really good writing. I find it more creepy than than horror. It definitely has some like unsettling uh, phases of it. But it's a very, very entertaining uh, experience and quite a nice game. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I will include the link in the description so you can go and play the demo yourself.